Just as Winrock International has become a global name, the name of Bill Clinton is considered probably the most recognizable and respected name in all the world today. And the beauty of all of this is that he has never once forgotten us. And his presence here with us today is a testament to this very unique bond forged long ago between Bill Clinton and the people of Arkansas and this state that he's always loved and has never forgotten nor ever forsaken. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor to present to you the 42nd President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton. Mr. President. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator uh, Frank, Congressman Snyder, Mayor Stodel, and Mayor Hayes, uh, members of the legislature, Dean Rutherford, friends, I'm glad to be here. I, you know, the truth is that. That probably is my primary identity today, being Hillary's husband, <laughs> father of the bride. <laughs> you know, one of the great things is that I know I'm late today, and I know I was almost always late when I was governor, but I'm actually early about 75% of the time now. It's amazing when you don't have anything important to do, how <laughs> easy it is to be on time. But I sat on the tarmac for a long time in New York today, so I couldn't help that. It wasn't my fault. And then Congressman Snyder and I had a little errand to run before we came over here, which we did do. Uh, I was sitting there listening to David talk and thinking all over again, it's no wonder he was always more popular than me. <laughs> but I too remember the day that I met him as if it were yesterday. And it was obvious to me that he was on his way to Congress and Lord knows where else. And I was a college student who was mightily impressed that uh, he and Barbara took time to talk to me. Once later, when I was in uh, college, he may not remember this, I was a senior at Georgetown. I was walking down Wisconsin Avenue at night, and he and Barbara were walking the other way. And they were going to eat dinner or something. They asked me to come join them. I was just some standing on the street. And uh, that's the kind of person he was. It's why we all loved him and still do. And I was profoundly honored, for those of you who come here from other states, that David Pryor agreed to be the first dean of our School of Public Service here. And uh, it is still, I believe, the only place in America where you can get a graduate degree in public service as opposed to public policy. And, Half of the work is done in the field, which is kind of what I want to say to all of you about Winrock. I, I just, most of the events I will do down here, this, uh, in the two days I'm going to be here, will be for people who are running for office in what is supposed to be a terrible time for my party because the economy's in bad shape and people are mad and they got a right to their anger. But I think it is worth pointing out what gave birth to Winrock 25 years ago. Because right now everybody's worried about how to get out of this immediate mess we're in. And it's profoundly troubling. But it really comes on top of almost four decades now of a profound increase in inequality in America and around the world. And the Rockefeller family cared about that. I always marveled. I, I still remember when Winthrop Rockefeller basically stepped into the line of fire in a race riot in the 60s and at considerable physical risk to himself. I remember when he was governor and I came home from Oxford and this African-American friend of mine and I thought we were doing a big deal. We organized a rock and roll band and held an integrated dance. It turned out to be a big mistake. <laughs> we had an integrated brawl that ended the dance. But um, I remember those times and I remember that 
There was this really rich guy who could have been doing anything he wanted to do, who cared about the fact that there were too many poor people. So I, I say that to remind us all that the current financial crisis, which deserves our attention and deserves some very specific actions, even if cured, has to be seen in light of the larger trend that has been really rampant throughout the world in the last 40 years of sustainably, uh, substantially increasing inequality, both within and among nations. Half the world's people still live on about two bucks a day or less. In Haiti, where I spend an enormous amount of time now working with the Prime Minister of Haiti on the Reconstruction Commission, before the earthquake, their equivalent of the financial crisis, before, 75 percent of them were living on two dollars a day or less. A billion people live on less than a dollar a day. A billion people go to bed hungry every night. A billion people have no access to clean water. Two and a half billion people have no access to sanitation. One in four deaths every year come from AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and infections related to dirty water. The dirty water deaths are 80 percent children five years of age and younger. And one of the great miracles, knock on wood, so far about having 1.7 million Haitians stuck in tents and tarps in the rainy season and the hurricane season that so far we've had no big outbreak of cholera, dysentery, diarrhea, any of the waterborne illnesses. But if you've been watching the similar heartbreaking tragedy in Pakistan, they already have cholera cases among children. The adults will by and large live over this, but the children will not. And I just want to kind of put this into some perspective, because we're struggling to get out of this, and it's taken longer than everybody wants, but when we do get out of it, and we will, we're going to be a lot better off than most of the rest of the people in the world, and it will prove the wisdom of the Rockefeller family in endowing this and the wisdom of the work that Winrock has done for the last 25 years. And the truth is that the two things are closely connected because until we have a more broadly shared and more sustainable prosperity, the world will continue to suffer from inequality and instability and the consequences of our energy use. So as you think about that on the 25th anniversary of Winrock, I want to thank you for all you have done. I think it's great that Winrock, Heifer, and the Clinton Presidential Center are three NGOs headquartered in a small space in Arkansas, all of whom have Leeds-rated international headquarters. And I thank you for the work you've done on that. But I'd like to talk to you about, you know, kind of what all this means. America has always been, probably of all the advanced countries in the world, the most fertile ground for operations like Winrock. Our affinity for non-governmental organizations is older than the Constitution. Benjamin Franklin organized the first volunteer fire department in Philadelphia before the Constitution was ratified. A few decades later, in the early 1830s, Alexis de Tocqueville came here from France and traipsed around America and was awestruck. He said the principal difference <clears throat> between the United States and what my successor in the White House affectionately referred to as old Europe, uh, was that when something didn't get done over there, people complained to the state to do something about it. And they just kept on complaining until the state did something about it, or didn't, as the case may be. He said, now in America they, claim for a day, uh, they complain for a day or two, and then they just organize themselves and go do something about it. And. Uh, so we've been about that. But one of the most hopeful developments <clears throat> of our move from the 20th into the 21st century 
has been the literal veritable explosion of the non-governmental movement in the United States and around the world, so that we now have lots of company. Winrock has lots of company. We, before the financial meltdown, which took some of the family foundations out, the United States had one million foundations doing work. Not counting the 335,000 religious organizations involved in non-governmental activity. One half of that one million have been established since 1995. That is a stunning statistic. One of the th reasons that we haven't had more health-related problems coming out of the hurricane and, I mean, the earthquake in Haiti is that even before the earthquake, Haiti was second only to India in the number of NGOs active on the ground there, both local and international, per capita. India has a half a million active domestic NGOs and another half million plus from around the world active there, many of them from the Indian diaspora. So they have a rich heritage of it. But China now has more than 200,000 registered NGOs and probably at least that many unregistered for political reasons. In Russia, there was a determined effort in the last decade to stamp out the NGO movement, but they still got about 150,000 plugging right along, arguing for everything from human rights to economic development in rural areas. And the reasons are clear, but, and I'll just, but I think there are two that are more important than any other. First of all, Let's put something up front. The work that you and I do, no matter how good it is, will never be a substitute for a vibrant private economy and good government. We all know that. In fact, increasingly, both you and my foundation <laughs> have looked for partners to try to make sure that when we complete whatever it is we're doing, either the economy will be more vibrant or the government will be better or both. But still there is a unique role for us to play for two reasons. One is, as we have learned over the long history of America, there is always going to be a gap between where we are and where we ought to be, always. Even if that magical day comes when the economy is humming along beautifully and everybody you vote for wins and they do everything you want them to do, and every CEO is a genius in maximizing employment and everything, there will always be gaps in the fabric of life in our country, and the same is true throughout the world. Second, both government and the private sector, no matter how well they do whatever it is they're doing, will always be somewhat slow to deal with emerging social problems. And one of the things that we can do, which is one reason I love Winrock, because you think about this, is to figure out how to address these problems faster, better, less expensively, so that you provide a model for what can be done by others with more money and more reach. And I, I tell everybody, you know, that most of the decades I was in politics, which I love, we mostly argued about two things. What are you going to do, and how much money are you going to spend on it? 